we are going to start series of lectures discussing early pregnancy complications complications in early pregnancy are ectopic pregnancy miscarriage gestational trophoblastic diseases hyperemesis gravidarum recurrent miscarriage and termination of pregnancy ectopic pregnancy instance 11.1 per thousand pregnancies but it actually represents 3 to 5 percent of patients presented to early pregnancy units the difference is these patients who present to the early pregnancy unit are actually referred from their gp or coming because of a complaint which is most likely pain or bleeding which are symptoms of ectopic pregnancy but in general population its percent is 11.1 per thousand risk factor any factor that delay or prevent migration of oocytes like pelvic inflammatory disease as you know pelvic inflammatory disease can be complicated by adhesions and these adhesions will delay the migration of oocytes and accordingly will lead to ectopic pregnancy as it will lead to implantation of the fertilized ova inside the fallopian tube intrauterine contraceptive device sterilization and this ectopic in the sterilization is quite common and this failure of sterilization is 1 in 200 but unfortunately if it fails the most likely pregnancy will be an ectopic pregnancy tubal surgery previous ectopic increase the risk of a recurrent ectopic assist reproduction and the use of mini belts this slide shows the types of ectopic pregnancy the most common is tubal and the most common part of tubal is the ampullary followed by the isthmus followed by the interstitial other slides include ovarian ectopic pregnancy, cervical ectopic pregnancy, cesarean scar ectopic pregnancy, and an abdominal ectopic pregnancy. Clinical picture of ectopic pregnancy. The most common symptoms is abdominal or pelvic pain, amenorrhea or missed period, vaginal bleeding with or without blood clots. Other reported symptoms include breast tenderness, gastrointestinal symptoms, dizziness, fainting or syncope, shoulder tip pain, urinary symptoms, passage of tissue, rectal pressure or pain modification. That's why it's very important for to, to, to do a pregnancy test for any woman in a childbearing period who represents with any of these symptoms. And we have cases who present to emergency department with vomiting and diarrhea. A pregnancy test was missed and we discovered that she has an ectopic after it's ruptured. So again, I have to emphasize the idea, it's very important to do a pregnancy test for any woman in a child bleeding period presenting with these symptoms. Signs of ectopic pregnancy. The most common signs are pelvic tenderness, adnexal tenderness, abdominal tenderness, other reported signs, cervical motion tenderness, or what we call cervical excitation, rebound tenderness or peritoneal signs, pallor, Abdominal distension, enlarged uterus, tachycardia more than 100 beat per minute or hypotension less than 100 over 60 mm G, shock or collapse, orthostatic hypotension. You have to refer to an early pregnancy assessment service or out of hour guidance service if early pregnancy assessment service is available for any woman with bleeding or other symptoms and signs of early pregnancy complication who have pain, pregnancy of six weeks or more. Pregnancy of uncertain gestation and the urgency of this referral will depend on the clinical condition. Investigation first is pregnancy test, serum beta HCG. Ultrasound has a cutoff value for serum beta HCG. For transvaginal ultrasound scan, it's between 800 and 1000, and for transabdominal ultrasound scan, it's between 1000 and 1500. The ultrasound features include empty uterus, adnexal mass moving similar to the ovary, containing a retentional sac which can contain a yolk sac or a fetal pool, or complex inhomogeneous adnexal mass moving similar to the ovary, or collection of fluid in the cavity which we call it a pseudosac, 
with moderate to large amount of free fluid in the peritoneal cavity or pouch of Douglas, which might represent hemoperitoneum. When carrying out transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound scan during early pregnancy, you should scan the uterus and the adnexa to see if there is a heterotopic pregnancy. So, identifying an intrauterine pregnancy cannot exclude the presence of coexistent ectopic pregnancy. That's why it's very important in early pregnancy scans to scan both the uterus and both adnexa. Beta SCG and the pregnancy of unknown location. As I said in the previous slide, there is a cut of value for the ultrasound to be able to identify pregnancy. So if the beta SCG is below this cut of value, what we need to do? We need to repeat the beta SCG in 48 hours. Then you have one of three scenarios. The first scenario is beta SCG increase at least more than 63%. This is likely an intrauterine pregnancy, and in this case, you can provide the patient with TV scan 7 to 14 days or earlier if the level is more than 1500. Or beta-CG drop by more than 50% is likely a miscarriage. In this case, patient should do a pregnancy test in 14 days. If it is negative, there is no action to be done as it is most likely a miscarriage. If it is still positive, it will require an urgent review. Problem will happen if the beta-CG increase but less than 63% or decrease but less than 50%. In this case, it will require an urgent review. So what is the management of ectopic pregnancy? We have three lines of management of tubal ectopic pregnancy. We have expectant, medical, and surgical. For expectant management, patient should be clinically stable, pain-free, mass less than 35 millimeters with no visible fetal heart on TV scan, beta HCG less than 1,000, we can consider expectant management if beta HCG is between 1000 and 1500 and patient is able to return for follow up. And if we follow the expectant management, we should repeat beta HCG in day 2, day 4, and day 7. There must be persistent drop in the beta HCG. If the beta HCG increases, there is no rule for expectant management and we don't need to give the patient NTD for expectant management. Medical management, patient should have no significant pain, it should be unruptured tubal ectopic pregnancy, mass less than 35 mm with no visible fetal heart on transvaginal scan, beta HCG less than 1500, however, we can consider medical treatment in beta HCG values up to 5000. Patient shouldn't have an intrauterine pregnancy, and patient should be compliant with follow-up. And in this case, we have to do beta HCG on day 4, then day 7, and then weekly. We compare the HCG value between day 4 and day 7. There must be a drop at least 15%. And if this drop doesn't happen, then we have either to consider another dose of misperfate or surgical option. And again, there is no need to give NTD with medical management of ectopic. Surgical management. Is indicated for patient with significant pain, adnexal mass equal or more than 35 mm, fetal heartbeat visible on ultrasound scan, beta HCG level more than or equal 5000, and mistroxate is not acceptable to the woman or unable to return to follow up. It can be either laparotomy or laparoscopy, and laparoscopy is the preferred route because of the benefits of laparoscopy. It can be salpingectomy or salpingostomy and it depends on the condition of the other tube. So if the other tube is healthy, then salpingectomy is the first line. However, if the other tube is removed before or diseased, then salpingostomy can be considered. If we do salpingectomy, patient need to have a pregnancy test after three weeks. But after salpingostomy, we have to do an HCG on day seven, then weekly. NTD is required in case of surgical management of ectopic in an RH negative patient. We have to counsel the patient about the fertility potentials after salpingectomy, especially if diseased contralateral tube or previous ectopic pregnancy. There was no difference between following expectant or medical management in the rate of ectopic pregnancy 
in the risk of tubal rupture, in the need for additional treatment, in the health status, depression, or anxiety score. Please remember, nitroxate should only be offered on a first visit where there's definite diagnosis of an extra pregnancy and a viable intrauterine pregnancy has been excluded. Advise women who choose nitroxate that the chance of needing further investigation and intervention is increased and they may need to be urgently admitted if their condition deteriorates. Women receiving nitroxate will have some abdominal pain initially, will have increase in level of beta HG on day 4. They have to understand that, but at the same time, cautious should be advised in case of management of an abdominal pain following nitroxate administration for an extra pregnancy, as it can notify rupture of an extra pregnancy. When surgical treatment is indicated for a woman with an extra pregnancy, it should be performed laparoscopically, as we said before. Don't offer anti prophylaxis to women who receive solely medical management of extra pregnancy or miscarriage, or for a patient who has pregnancy of a known location. There is no need to use clay Howard test for quantifying fetal maternal hemorrhage. So what are different types of ectopic pregnancy, how to diagnose and how to treat? The first one is cervical ectopic pregnancy. It is diagnosed by ultrasound showing empty uterus, barrel shaped cervix, gestational sac present below the level of internal os, absence of a sliding sign, blood flow around the sac using colored Doppler. The ultrasound feature is quite diagnostic of a cervical ectopic pregnancy. And the management is mainly medical because surgical management has a high failure rate and it should be reserving only for women suffering from life-threatening hemorrhage. And unfortunately, this woman may end up having a hysterectomy. However, there are studies showing the possibility of removal of cervical lateral pregnancies through hysteroscopic resection other than through suction evacuation, under ultrasound guidance, or even laparoscopic guidance, and show success rate. For the Daniel scar ectopic pregnancy, it's 1 in 2000, diagnosed again by ultrasound showing empty uterine cavity, uterine sac or solid mass of trophoblast located anteriorly at the level of the internal os, embedded at the site of previous cesarean section as shown in the slide, Thin or absent layer of mammetrium between the cesarean section sac and the bladder, evidence of prominent trophoblastic slash placental circulation on Doppler with empty intervacular canal. As you can see from the slide, the sac is located mainly outside of the scar between an empty uterine cavity and empty cervical canal. We don't need any biochemical investigation for diagnosis. We can use the MRI as a second line of investigation if the diagnosis is equivocal. Management is either medical or surgical, with or without hemostatic measures. There is insufficient evidence to recommend any intervention over the other. However, the current literature supports surgical rather than medical approach. With Zenith scar pregnancy, we have two different types of pregnancies. The first type would be progressing in the uterine cavity as the sac grows and develops with potential to reach a viable gestational age but with the risk of massive bleeding from the implantation side and the risk of placenta accreta or increta. But the second is the progression deeper towards the serosal surface of the uterus with the risk of first trimester rupture and hemorrhage. Primary medical treatment consists of using nitroxate which can be administered by local injection in the sac under ultrasound guidance or systemic by intramuscular injection. Local injection seems to be more effective in means of termination of pregnancy. However, use of medical management has some disadvantages. It's that the trophoblasts remain in situ, so there's still risk of hemorrhage as they retained often very vascular placental tissue degenerate. Some authors have advocated using suction evacuation in addition to mistroxate 
to hasten resolution and reduce the risk of unpredictable hemorrhage in the follow-up period. Surgical treatment consists of either evacuation of pregnancy using suction or hysteroscopic resection, or excision of pregnancy as an open laparoscopic or transvaginal route. Suction evacuation is probably the most frequently described procedure, has been combined with cervical circlage, fully castor, insertion of return artery embolization as an additional hypothetic measures. Excisional technique has the advantage of incorporating a repair of a scar because we are actually excising the scar with the pregnancy and then repairing the scar back. But the procedures are technically more difficult and invasive, not known whether scar repair reduces the risk of recurrent scar pregnancy or scar rupture in future pregnancies. Interstitial pregnancy it's about 1 to 6.3%, diagnosed by ultrasound showing empty uterine sac both of conception and retina sac located laterally in the interstitial intramural part of the tube, surrounded by less than 5 mm of myometrium in all imaging planes, as shown in the slide, with presence of the interstitial line sign as shown by the right arrow. Serum beta CG should be carried out at diagnosis, and sometimes we need a repeat one. Non-surgical management is recommended for stable interstitial pregnancy. Expectance is only suitable for women with low or significantly falling beta-HCG level in whom additional methotrexate may not improve the outcome. Methotrexate is insufficient evidence to recommend whether local or systemic approach, but it's an effective management. Surgical management includes laparoscopic corneal resection or salpingotomy. Alternative technique is hysteroscopic resection under laparoscopic or ultrasound guidance. There is insufficient evidence on the safety and complication in future pregnancies to recommend other non-surgical methods. For corneal pregnancy, it's about 1 in 76,000, so it's really quite rare. You can see visualization of a single interstitial portion of fallopian tube in the main uterine body, you see the sac or process of conception seen mobile and separate from the uterus and completely surrounded by myometrium, with a vascular pedicle adjoining the sac to the unicornic uterus. The management is excision of the rudimentary horn, either through laparoscopy or laparotomy. Ovarian pregnancy. There is no specific criteria for ovarian pregnancy, but usually it's an empty uterus, wide echogenic ring with an internal anechoic area on the ovary, negative sliding, si sliding organ sign, it is not possible to separate the cystic structure or the sac from the ovary on gentle palpation. Corpus luteum should be identified separate from the suspected ovarian pregnancy. Color Doppler may aid detection of the fetal heart pulsation in the ovary or a complex echogenic admixture matrix free fluid which is rupture of ovarian ectopic pregnancy. And the management is definitive surgical treatment. It's preferred if laparoscopy is required to make diagnosis, removal of the gestational product by inoculation or wedge resection. In presence of large ectopic pregnancy is preferred. Inoculation the birth of conception bluntly from the ovary minimize damage to the surrounding ovarian tissue. You must achieve homeostasis by electrocautery or by suturing. Ophrectomy is occasionally required when there is a coexisting ipsilateral ovarian pathology or excessive bleeding. However, if the risk of surgery is high or postoperative with the presence of persistent residual thermoplast tissue, as presently raised beta HCG level, we can offer the woman systemic methotrexate. Heterotopic pregnancy in which ultrasound findings demonstrate an intrauterine pregnancy and a coexisting ectopic pregnancy. Serum beta HCG level is of limited value in diagnosis of heterotopic pregnancy. Intrauterine pregnancy must be considered in the management plan. Mistroxate should only be considered if the intrauterine pregnancy is non-viable or if the woman does not wish to continue with the pregnancy. Local injection of potassium chloride or hyperosmolar glucose with aspiration of the sac content is an option for a clinically stable woman. 
Surgical removal of the ectopic pregnancy is the method of choice for hemodynamically unstable women and it's also an option for hemodynamically stable women who would like to preserve the intrauterine pregnancy. Expectant management is an option in heterotopic pregnancy where the ultrasound findings are of a non-viable pregnancy.